Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the visual system. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing phototransduction, and the point that we've got to so far is that we have seen that when uh, a photon hits a rhodopsin receptor, what will happen is that photon can be absorbed by the 11 cis retinal molecule that is part of the rhodopsin receptor, and it will then photoisomerize back to all transretinal. And when you've got all transretinal now bound to the opsin, the opsin will want to be in a different conformation to the conformation that it was previously in when it was bound to 11 cis retinal. So what's going to happen is the G protein coupled receptor is going to change conformation and it's now going to interact with downstream signaling molecules inside the cytoplasm of the cell uh, to trigger an electrical signal. And it's that downstream signaling pathway that I now want to go over to. So, if you know anything at all about G-protein coupled receptor signaling, you'll know that G-protein coupled receptors, once they're in the active state, which this one now is, are going to activate heterotrimeric G-proteins. And metarhodopsin 2 is going to activate a heterotrimeric G-protein by the name of rod transducin. And you might just hear this called transducin, but we should specifically say rod transducin because we are discussing the photoreceptor sorry, the phototransduction pathway in rod cells, and the transducin heterotrimate G protein is different between rod and cone cells. It does the same thing, but it is fundamentally a different protein. Okay, so rod transducin then, it's a heterotrimeric G protein, so there's another key term, so heterotrimeric G protein. Now, a heterotrimeric G protein uh, is made up of three separate proteins, hence its name heterotrimeric. Trimeric means three-membered, hetero means different, so it's made up of three separate proteins, an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. And this protein can be in two different states. It can be in an on state, and it can be in an off state. And in the on state, the heterotrimeric G protein is split into two separate portions and the alpha subunit has GTP bound to it, whilst in the off state it's all bound as a trimer and the alpha subunit has GDP bound to it. We will start off by discussing transducin in the off state and of course what's going to happen is the metarhodopsin 2 is going to activate it and turn it into the on state. Now the off state rod transducin protein is actually attached to the rhodopsin protein, so it's fairly nearby, right and ready basically, for the metarhodopsin 2 to now activate it. So let me just draw it in here. So, here this is supposed to represent the alpha subunit of the rod transducin, and the alpha subunit is by the name of alpha T1. Okay, so alpha and then subscript T1, so the T is clearly for transducin, and the 1 there tells you that this is rod alpha subunit of transducin, rather than the cone alpha subunit, which will be alpha T2, which is a different protein. It does the same thing, but it is fundamentally a different protein. And it's currently in the off state, so it has GDP bound to it here, guanosine diphosphate, rather than GTP. It will also have a lipid molecule attached to it, which will be anchoring it in the phospholipid bilayer here. So that's what that line's representing, a lipid molecule that's attached onto the protein and which is implanted in the phospholipid bilayer there. Now, the alpha subunit is in the off state, it's got GDP bound to it, and in this off state it will be bound to the beta-gamma subunit, which is made up of two separate proteins, the beta subunit and the gamma subunit. The gamma subunit also has a lipid moiety attached to it to implant it in the phospholipid by there. So let me colour in these different proteins. So here is the alpha subunit here, alpha T1 as I say, okay, uh, which is specific to rod transducin and it's currently in the off state with GDP bound to it, and here we have the beta and the gamma subunits. Now, there are loads of different possible beta subunits and there are loads of different possible gamma subunits. 
For our purposes, we're not going to fuss about that. It's not important for this pathway, so we'll just call this a beta subunit and this a gamma subunit. Okay, but be aware that there are lots of different types of beta subunits and lots of different types of gamma subunits that you can use in heterotrimetry proteins. And in rod transducing, there will be certain beta and certain gamma subunits that will be favoured and will be produced in the highest amounts. Uh, but we won't go into that level of detail. Okay, so the important thing then about rod transducin, which is the name for the entire heterotrimeric G protein, and if you wanted to give it a short name, you'd call it GT1, like so. Okay, so this is the shorthand name for rod transducin. The important thing about it is not which beta and gamma subunit it has. We don't care about that. The bit that we care about is what alpha subunit it has. That's the bit that makes this heterotrimeric G protein the rod transducing heterotrimeric G protein. It's the major portion of heterotrimeric G proteins. And rod transducing has the alpha T1 subunit rather than some of those other alpha subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins that you may have heard of before, such as alpha S, alpha I, alpha Q, alpha 11 maybe, alpha 12, alpha 13, all of those ones, they're different. Um, here we have alpha T1, which is the key alpha subunit for making this rod transducing. Okay, so currently it's in the off state. Our rod transducin heterotrimeric G proteins in the off state. Our alpha subunit has GDP bound to it, and in that state it wants to bind to the beta gamma subunit. So the beta and gamma subunits, they never come apart. They always remain bound together. So we often refer to them collectively as the beta gamma subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein. And this entire off-state rod transducin is going to be bound to our rhodopsin um, receptor. So when the photon comes then and photoisomerizes the 11 cis retinal into all trans retinal, and therefore the rhodopsin turns into metarhodopsin 2, it's now going to be capable of binding to this uh, heterotrimeric G protein here, this rod transducin in a new way, and it's now going to cause the activation of the rod transducin, and to activate it, what you have to do is catalyze the release of the guanosine diphosphate. So this will interact with the metarhodopsin 2, and it will cause the GDP that's bound to the alpha subunit to leave the binding site here, and instead what will now happen is a GTP molecule from the cytoplasm will come into this binding site here, and will replace the GDP. And when GTP binds in there, instead of GDP, what will happen is the alpha subunit will change conformation, and in this new conformation, it will cleave away from the metarhodopsin 2, it will also cleave away from the beta and gamma subunits, and what you'll end up with now, drawing the result down here, here's the membrane, here is the alpha subunit, now in the on state here, so here is our alpha T1 subunit with guanosine triphosphate bound to it. And here is the beta gamma subunit over here. And they're separate, but they're still attached to the phospholipid bi there because of their lipid moieties, which hook them into the lipid bi there. So I'll just colour this in. So here's our on state alpha T1 protein here. And then the beta and gamma subunit have gone off. Okay, and what's now going to happen is this on-state alpha T1 protein is then going to trigger a change. It's going to activate a certain enzyme by the name of phosphodiesterase 6. But we'll come on to that in just a moment. I just want to review what we've just been over. So, we've just been over the next stage in this pathway, the way in which the change in the rhodopsin receptor is actually going to pass on that message. And the way it's going to pass it on is it's going to activate these rod transducin heterotrimeric G proteins. So rod transducin is a heterotrimeric G protein, which means it consists of an alpha, a beta, and a gamma subunit. We don't care about what the beta and the gamma subunit are. The important thing that makes this heterotrimeric G protein rod transducin is the alpha subunit. And the alpha subunit will specifically be the alpha T1 subunit. So, initially, the heterotrimeric G protein will be in the off state, where the alpha T1 subunit has GDP bound to it, and in that state it will want to bind to the beta gamma subunit. Okay, so it will all be together as a great big trimer here. 
This thing will attach itself to the rhodopsin receptor, then when the rhodopsin receptor becomes activated to metarhodopsin 2, it will interact in a new way with the metarhodopsin 2, and the metarhodopsin 2 will catalyze the release of the GTP, and GTP will come in and bind to the alpha T1 subunit instead, and then both of these two subunits will cleave away from the metarhodopsin 2 and cleave away from each other. So you've now got the activated alpha T1 subunit down here going off this way, and the beta gamma subunit going off a different way. We don't care about what the beta gamma subunit does. There is a lot of research into what the beta gamma subunits do, but for our purposes, um, the alpha T1 subunit is the more important one now. And what's it going to go and do? It's going to go and activate an enzyme that's attached to the phospholipid bi there. So here is this enzyme. Here's the phospholipid bi there. And I don't know exactly how it's attached to the phospholipid bi there, whether it's attached to certain proteins that are in the membrane or whether it too has lipid moieties. But what I do know is it's attached to the phospholipid bi there in some way. Okay, and this is by the name of phosphodiesterase 6, which for short we'll abbreviate down to PDE6. So its full name is phospho, that's the P, and then di, that's the D, esterase, that's the E, and then there are lots of different types of phosphodiesterase. This is specifically a phosphodiesterase 6 enzyme. Okay, so here is phosphodiesterase 6 attached to the cell membrane, and now what's going to happen is this alpha T1 subunit that's in the activated state is going to bind to the phosphodiesterase 6, and it's going to activate that enzyme. So I'll just bring this up a little bit. Okay, so now this enzyme is going to become activated, so those are the sparks to show it's activated. And what's it now going to do? Well, what do phosphodiesterase enzymes do? They break down cyclic nucleotides, and phosphodiesterase 6 specifically breaks down cyclic GMP in these photoreceptor cells, um, rather than cyclic AMP. So cyclic GMP is the one that's important here. Cyclic AMP is the more famous one, but here it's cyclic GMP that's important. So normally, in the resting photoreceptor, so when the photoreceptor is not being exposed to light, so in the dark, you have some cyclic GMP inside the cytoplasm of the cell, and we'll discuss what this cyclic GMP is doing normally in the dark in just a moment. What's going to happen is when we expose the photoreceptor to light, you're going to activate the phosphodiesterase 6, and therefore the cyclic GMP is all going to be broken down to GMP, so you're going to break the cycle within the cyclic GMP molecule, and you're just going to make it GMP. So I might just draw a little cartoon to show you what's actually going to happen here. So here comes a little cartoon of the structure of cyclic GMP. So of course this is cyclic guanosine monophosphate, and I could do with somewhere to write that down, so I'll put it here. So cyclic GMP stands for cyclic guanosine, and then the MP is for monophosphate. So what does this mean? Well firstly, what does guanosine mean? Guanosine means guanine, the organic base guanine, bound to ribose, okay, which is a sugar. So I'm drawing this here. So this rectangle will represent the guanine organic base, so that's guanine here, okay. So I'll just colour this in in orange. So that's guanine, and then this pentagon here is representing the ribose sugar. So it should also have a carbon up here. So this is an oxygen at the top, and then five carbons in this position, this position, this position, this position, and this position. So that's our ribose sugar. And together, guanine plus ribose makes guanosine. So that's what is meant by guanosine. That molecule that I've drawn so far is guanosine. And what we're now going to do is we're going to add on to the guanosine a phosphate group. And you add it on off here, off this fifth carbon up here. And if you just have the phosphate group like that, that is guanosine monophosphate. To create cyclic guanosine monophosphate, you have to link this phosphate group not only to the fifth carbon, but also to the third carbon down here. So cyclic guanosine monophosphate, forget this bit, instead it would be down like this. Okay, so the phosphate group would be linked both to the fifth carbon and the third carbon there, and you'd have, as you can see, a nice cycle there, which is why it's called cyclic guanosine monophosphate. 
Phosphodiesterase 6 will cleave this bond here, and therefore it will return cyclic guanosine monophosphate to guanosine monophosphate. Okay, so that's what phosphodiesterase 6 is going to do. It's going to break down all of the cyclic guanosine monophosphate that's usually present inside the photoreceptor in the dark to guanosine monophosphate, and therefore whatever that cyclic guanosine monophosphate was doing, it's going to stop doing it. So the next question becomes, what was the cyclic guanosine monophosphate doing 